Here's the map of Africa. Africa makes up nearly one-fifth of the planet's land area and is the second largest continent after Asia. The Atlantic Ocean borders the continent on the west, the Mediterranean Sea on the north, the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean on the east, and the waters of the Atlantic and Indian Seas on the south. Africa is the oldest inhabited continent on Earth, earning it the moniker Mother Continent. Africa has been home to humans and their ancestors for more than five million years. From sand-covered deserts to lush rainforests, Africa is home to a wide variety of habitats. A huge amount of the world's mineral resources, including some of the largest stocks of fossil fuels, metallic ores, jewels, and precious metals, are found in Africa. A wide variety of biological resources, such as the very lush equatorial rainforests of Central Africa and the famous wildlife populations of the eastern and southern regions of the continent, complement this wealth. This part of the world is home to some terrifying discoveries as well. Join us as we explore terrifying new discoveries in Africa that change everything. The Mystery of Namibia's Desert Fairy Circles The Narbib Desert is covered in thousands of fairy rings, but why is there such a large polka dot pattern? People have spent a lot of time trying to figure out why particular planetary occurrences happen, whether they are caused by geological, celestial, environmental, or weather factors. But without science, people have frequently turned to storytelling. Some prehistoric tribes thought the sun's momentary extinguishment during a total eclipse was the consequence of some horrible creature attempting to swallow it whole. Tsunamis, volcano eruptions, and earthquakes have all been attributed to divine vengeance. Many of these phenomena have been explained scientifically throughout the years, although there isn't always unanimity among researchers, as is the case with Namibia's fairy circles. The circles are actually vegetation-covered bare soil spots. They can be found in their thousands in the Namib Desert. In great part, the fairy rings have eluded understanding. Local folklore claims that these are either charred spots brought about by a dragon's hot breath or footprints left by the gods. Ostriches rolling around in the dust and radioactive contamination are two explanations put up by scientists as to why the rings are formed. There are, however, two widely accepted theories that have fervent supporters that explain how the circles formed. According to one theory, the circular patches are the result of sand termites clearing vegetation from surrounding their nests underneath. The alternative argument is that the pattern might be explained by plants vying for water. So are they termites or plants? The demands of each camp's respective beliefs are hotly defended, but research from a team of scientists published in the journal Nature suggests that both hypotheses are valid. Both mechanisms taken separately cannot account for the emergence of the circles. The pattern might be best explained by the interaction of the termites and plants, according to the team's computer models. Nevertheless, not everyone appreciates this suggestion. The research did not address the prevalence of such rings in places free of termites, according to Dr. Stephen Getzin of the German Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research, who is firmly on Team Plant. It appears that the enigma has not yet been fully solved. Anyone who is even the slightest bit interested in extraterrestrial life is looking for concrete evidence that they exist. The hard evidence has yet to materialize. Crop circle patterns appear to be one such instance, albeit conventional scientists have not yet verified their construction by extraterrestrial visitors. Another instance of proof of extraterrestrial visitors could be found in the stunning sky blue stone known as sky stones. Since the 1990s, legends have surrounded the blue stone with white veins that has a matte appearance. The narrative centers on an enigmatic character, a geologist by the name of Angelo Pitoni, who traveled to Sierra Leone in West Africa. A Fula chief in Sierra Leone sold the odd blue stones to Italian geologist Angelo Pitoni in 1990. The tribe insisted that the stones were left behind by heavenly visitors. Pitoni traveled back to Europe before bringing the enigmatic rocks to a university for examination. The findings revealed that the stones didn't correspond to any recognized mineral. The reason the stones kept their blue tint eluded the researchers as well. A small bit was ground up and examined under a microscope, but no blue tint was seen. High heat would not change the mineral in the stone, acids couldn't degrade it either. An additional examination revealed that 17.17% of the stone contained oxygen, calcium, carbon, and an unidentified organic substance made up the remaining components. The sky stones could be 55,000 years old or older. Because of the History Channel's Ancient Aliens series and another individual, American artist and designer Jared Collins, the tale has currently gathered prominence. 
Collins makes an appearance in the Star Gods of Sirius, carrying a briefcase full of Sky Stone samples. Collins confirmed that the Sky Stones are unlike anything on Earth after years of travel and study. It seems that each Sky Stone is unique. While not proof that extraterrestrials brought the stones to Earth, it's still compelling hard evidence and food for thought. It's only one part of a much bigger story concerning the African tribe's faith in heavenly beings. The Dendera Light The Egyptian goddess Hathor's temple at Dendera, which is one of the best-preserved ancient Egyptian temples, may have depicted such an artifact on one of its walls. This makes the Dendera light a particularly contentious topic because it's not exactly an artifact of potential ancient technology. Had electric lighting been invented in ancient Egypt? Three stone reliefs in the temple depict the so-called Dendera light, which at first resembles a crook's tube-shaped bulb with a lotus socket at one end, a cable running underneath it, and a snake-shaped cord filament inside. The lamp is held aloft by a priest in the most widely recognized illustration of the so-called Dendera light, and a few more tiny figures can be made out below it. The light bulb looks to be pointed upward by one of the characters. The bulb is also accompanied by a two-armed jet pillar, whose hands appear to be attached to the serpent or cord inside. The light is portrayed with a baboon holding two knives in front of it. The idea that this picture represented an electrical lamp was first put out by a Norwegian electrical engineer. However, the majority of Egyptologists assign a different meaning to the so-called Dendera light. The key is to keep in mind that the reliefs are accompanied by inscriptions and other pictures. Thus, when interpreting the vignettes, it is important to take the writing into account as well. The information directly related to the most renowned Dendera light scene is taken from a translation of the writings relating to these images by Egyptologist Dr. Wolfgang Waitkus. According to the inscriptions, Hasomtus, another creator god known as Horus, the unifier of two lands, is the serpent emerging from the lotus flower, and the jed pillar is carrying his corpse on the day barge, which is referred to as the cable in the Dendera light hypothesis. Symbols in the so-called Dendera light that are genuinely connected to Egyptian mythology are much easier to see now. According to an ancient Egyptian creation myth, a lotus flower was the first item to appear from the limitless primordial Sea of Nun, also known as the Sea of the Two Knives, which existed before creation. According to legend, that flower gave birth to Atam Ra, the sun deity. Similar to the relief at the Temple of Hathor in Dendera, there are other ancient representations of the lotus in the form of a lamp. We also know that Atam Ra was shown as a serpent in a bubble in subsequent artwork. The snake's surrounding bubble, or essence, could stand in for the universe's creation out of nothing. Therefore, the portrayal of the sun god coming from the lotus flower is considered by the majority of Egyptologists to be a clear interpretation of the Dendera light. Even more can be seen by carefully examining this contentious image and using our understanding of Egyptian mythology. As a result, many of the symbols depicted in the contentious reliefs that some claim reflect the Dendera light have roots in ancient Egyptian creation myths, rituals, important deities in their pantheon, and concepts of rebirth. The lack of historical literature debating the usage of electricity in ancient Egypt, which one would anticipate seeing if the reliefs represented electrical lamps, is another significant argument against the Dendera light hypothesis. Finally, it's important to keep in mind that despite excavating thousands of ancient sites across Egypt, Archaeologists have not discovered any clearly electrical objects, much less light bulbs. There is now no hard evidence to support the idea that ancient Egyptians used electrical lighting. According to the Dendera light hypothesis, the rituals around the use of electric lights would have been carried out in private rituals performed by the ancient priests close to New Year's creation-related festivals. That could imply that after the ceremonies, the artifacts themselves were also destroyed in secrecy or by ritual. We cannot ignore the inscriptions and the accompanying story that we can see unfolding in the vignettes, even though it's probable that some portions of the reliefs in the Temple of Hathor at Dendera are lacking from the interpretations we have today. Regardless of its significance, the Dendera reliefs continues to draw tourists from all over the world who are anxious to see the odd and contentious carvings of one of Egypt's most magnificent monuments. Ever heard of a lake that can turn you into a stone? The parched northern region of Tanzania is home to Lake Natron, which is unlike any other lake you've ever seen or heard of or possibly even imagined. Why? 
First off, parts of it occasionally turn red. We bet you've never seen a red lake. Lake Natron is distinctive not only because it occasionally turns red, but also because it's extremely caustic, alkaline, due to the surrounding volcano. It is poisonous to most animals because of this. In and around the lake, there are dead animals and birds. Because of this, Lake Natron is sometimes referred to as Tanzania's stunning but deadly red lake. So how is it lethal? Cyanobacteria are present in great abundance in Lake Natron's water. The majority of the species that eat this algae suffer cell, brain system, and liver damage as a result of the toxin it releases into the environment. As a result, many of the birds and animals that drink from Lake Natron wind up dead. The lake's mirror-like surface tempts birds into diving it, which gets them killed. The animals, birds, and bats that perish in the water become mummified replicas of themselves after being calcified. Many of these preserved creatures were placed in lifelike stances before being photographed by the great artist Nick Brandt. Lake Natron gets its name from the fact that it contains a lot of sodium carbonate, which is what Natron is. Why is Lake Natron red? Parts of the lake often appear as a deep red or orange. The cause of the colors is a type of algae. A type of bacteria that flourishes in soda lakes often creates algae blooms, which in turn color the water. The algae bloom of Lake Natron wax and wane, such that the lake's redness is not a fixed hue. The fringe of the lake also often looks more orange than red. Can any creature survive in this lake? Yes, the lake is a paradise for flamingos. They are protected against burns by their thick skin. Additionally, the lake is a secure environment for breeding since its toxicity deters predators. Notably, certain fish and invertebrate species can thrive closer to the lake's edges. When is this lake at its most beautiful? If you need walking tours around the lake, you can choose to visit it during the dry or rainy season, but avoid attempting to swim in it. The Mystery of the Giant Blue Eye of Africa in Mauritania The Rishat structure, commonly referred to as the Eye of the Sahara or the Blue Eye of Africa, is a notable circular geological formation in Mauritania's Sahara Desert, close to Uadane. It is quite noticeable from orbit and is almost 50 kilometers across. Its inferred age is greater than 100 million years. It was first thought to be an asteroid impact structure due to its high degree of circularity, and then it was thought to be a structure created by a volcanic eruption, which also seems unlikely given the lack of a dome of igneous rock or volcanic rock. However, it is now thought to be a highly symmetrical and deeply eroded geological dome that collapsed. According to a different team of scholars, it was created when God flooded the Earth during Noah's time. But many people now believe that erosion-sculpted, uplifted rock is what caused it. However, it is still unclear how the Rishat structure came to be almost circular and why the rings are equally spaced from the center. And new inquiries are raised. Some people are astounded by how much this edifice resembles Plato's depiction of Atlantis. There were two of land and three of water. Atlantis, when destroyed by the earthquake, became an insurmountable barrier of mud to voyagers sailing from hence to any region of the ocean said Plato on the island's circular shape. And he mentioned a mountain that protected the city from the north as well as one that embraced a wide plain with an oblong shape in the south. Greek refers to Atlantis as Nessos or the island of Atlas. So we're talking about a geological formation from 100 million years ago that might have been Atlantis right in Africa's Sahara Desert. Africa's Sahara Desert Africa, the hottest continent on Earth, has a large desert region covering much of its surface. Being the biggest desert on Earth, the Sahara is truly enormous. 9.4 million square kilometers make up its enormous size, which is larger than the entire USA. Another fascinating fact about the Sahara is that it's been expanding in the south at a rate of half a mile per month, or six miles per year, so it's becoming bigger. Although the Sahara Desert contains many different types of terrain, its most well-known feature is its sand dune fields, which are frequently shown in movies. The dune system makes up roughly 25% of the total desert and has a maximum height of over 600 feet, 183 meters. Many plant and animal species can be found in the Sahara despite its severe desert environment. The Sahara is home to more than 500 species of plants, 70 species of mammals, 90 species of birds, 100 species of reptiles, and several species of spiders, scorpions, and other small arthropods. Despite having North American roots, the camel is one of the most recognizable creatures of the Sahara. 
There are numerous other mammals that live in the Sahara, including gazelles, adexes, cheetahs, caracals, desert foxes, and wild dogs. Numerous species of snakes, lizards, and even crocodiles may survive and even thrive in the desert climate if there is enough water. The Sahara is also home to a variety of arthropod species, including dung beetles, scarab beetles, death stalker scorpions, and numerous ant species. According to scientists, plant species in the Sahara have adapted to the dry conditions by developing deep underground roots to uncover hidden water sources and spine-shaped leaves to reduce moisture loss. While the Nile Valley and other oasis regions of the desert host a wide variety of plants, including olive trees, date palms, and other shrubs and grasses, the driest parts of the desert are virtually barren of all plant life. Therefore, the fact that the largest frog species in the world is found in Africa may not actually come as a surprise. It goes by the moniker of a Goliath bullfrog. The giant slippery frog is another name for the Goliath bullfrog, Conrawa Goliath. It is the largest frog known to exist. This animal can weigh up to 8 pounds and reach a length from snout to vent up to 12.5 inches. A Goliath bullfrog is around the size of your average house cat. Even the average human newborn weighs less than this frog. Strangely, the vocal sac is absent in these huge bullfrogs. They're unable to create mating cries as a result. This adorable, huge, and harmless mammal is found in Equatorial Guinea and Cameroon. Being choosy feeders, goliath tadpoles primarily consume the plant Decraea warmingi, which is located close to waterfalls and along the banks of rapid rivers. As a result, between the nations of Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea, this species can only be found in one place in Africa. Dragonflies, locusts, and worms are among the insects that the adult goliath frog eats. Along with fish, they also consume other amphibians, including newts, salamanders, and smaller frogs, as well as mollusks, crabs, other crustaceans, young snakes, turtles, and small mammals. They require being close to water just like other amphibians. They emerge at night and sit on river rocks to search for prey such as mice, fish, crabs, young turtles, and so forth. Bullfrogs called goliaths have a lifespan of up to 15 years in the wild and over 20 years in captivity. They don't live as long in the wild for a variety of reasons. The main cause is primarily because they are being hunted for food, which is followed by habitat loss and degradation. Among other predators, it is preyed upon by snakes, Nile crocodiles, Nile monitors, and humans. Its size is so fascinating that it's been exported to zoos and pet trades. In addition, scientists have found a new kind of a widow spider in Africa, and it may be the deadliest in the entire globe. The dreaded black widow is closely related to the Pinda button spider, which was found for the first time in 28 years. Furthermore, according to Barbara Wright, the new species discoverer, its bite will be just as potent as that of its well-known cousin and necessitate medical attention. Despite the fact that the toxicology of this particular species has not yet been completed, she stated that all widow spiders, genus Lactrodectus, are regarded as medically significant due to their highly neurotoxic venom. Humans who are exposed to the venom may experience pain, palpitations, sweating, and vomiting. Three of the nine deadliest spiders in the world are previously undiscovered species of the widow spider. However, Latrodectus bites rarely cause mortality, and it is probable that the same will be true of the new species. The Pindar button, which is unique to South Africa's critically endangered sand woodlands, may be the world's biggest widow spider and is undoubtedly the biggest in Africa. Because the female has bright red markings on both her back, and her underside rather than just one, it can be distinguished from other spiders of her kind. Additionally, the spider produces distinctive purple egg sacs, each of which contains about 600 hatchlings. This is a significant discovery in the arachniverse. Speaking of a significant discovery, while playing in the field of his father's farm near Leidenberg M. Pumalanga, South Africa, a small boy named Karl Ludwig Ludi von Bezing, now a well-known Austrian South African mineral collector, noticed fragments of some unidentified heads. A few years later, he went back to the region, and over the course of several years, he gathered the fragments of seven heads. This significant discovery is known as the Leidenberg heads on a global scale. These objects represent one of the earliest types of African sculpture in southern Africa. There are seven hollow terracotta sculptures, each of which bears the name of the location where it was found in the late 1950s. Excavations indicate that the skulls may have been intentionally burned and buried rather than simply thrown away or forgotten. The function of the heads is unclear to date. Little is known about the people who made the masks, but judging by how carefully they were buried, 
the people who did so must have thought highly of the objects. On the forehead, temples, and in the space between the eyes, the heads exhibit scarification marks, scars purposefully made to make patterns on the flesh. Six of the heads are human, and the seventh is a fake animal head of some sort. Two of the seven heads are large enough to serve as helmets and are topped with little animal figurines. The other five have a hole in each side of the neck that was probably used to connect them to a costume or other object. African masks frequently have animal motifs. They stand in for an animal's spirit, and the person wearing the mask takes on the characteristics of that animal. This enables communication with the animal, such as asking it to stay away from the village. In other instances, the animal represents a virtue. The buffalo, hyena, hawk, crocodile, and antelope are the most frequently seen animals depicted by masks. One of the most popular animal masks is the antelope, and a little unidentified animal is perched on one of the Leidenberg heads. So what function did this mysterious animal serve for those who designed the Leidenberg heads? Although archaeologists are still unsure of their exact use, they have hypothesized that it was probably during initiation rituals, that is, during the rites of enactment that marked the shift to a new social rank or maybe membership in an exclusive group that they were utilized. The only option is to make educated guesses about the purpose and significance of a head like this one in the absence of contemporaneous written sources. Do you know that the second deadliest global conflict after World War II happened in Africa? The Second Congo War, which began in August 1998, happened only one year on after the First Congo War and is the second deadliest worldwide conflict subsequent only to World War II. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, formerly Zaire, served as the primary theater of the Second Congo War. The war started in 1998 and was declared over in 2003 after the establishment of a transitional government. It was the largest interstate conflict in contemporary African history, directly involving nine different countries and 20 or so armed organizations, earning the nicknames Africa's World War and Great War of Africa. Over the course of the war, rape was employed as a weapon of war. Amnesty International, a human rights organization, estimated in October 2004 that 40,000 rape instances had been reported over the previous six years, with the majority taking place in South Kivu. In addition to causing physical and mental harm to the victims, the endemic nature of rape in the conflict facilitated the spread of HIV and other STDs in the area. The war is believed to have caused 3.8 million deaths, most of which were caused by malnutrition and illness. Millions more people lost their homes and fled to neighboring nations in search of safety. The war was formally ended in July 2003, and the former combatants agreed to form a government of national unity, but the state was still weak, and much of the eastern region was plagued by violent strife. According to estimates, violence and disruptions to the provision of basic social services and food caused 1,000 deaths a day in 2004. It was a period of great darkness and strife in the country. Let us know what you think of these discoveries in the comments section below.